there are three important rules. Parents' words are absolute. Powers cannot be used without parents' permission. And finally, in case the parent's safety is threatened, ignore all of them. Our children are good. They are angelic, different from any other child in the world. But not everyone can become their parents. A child was crying profusely while a gentle nun tried to calm her with a smile. Her classmates surrounded her, comforting her, when a man approached, drawing everyone's attention. From today on, I will be your father, the fat man wearing a suit and smoking a cigar said as he placed his hand on one of the boy's shoulders. Because these children are for special parents and have received special education, the man, dressed in a luxurious fur coat, led the boy to an equally luxurious car, while the child looked back, gazing at his classmates who waved. Special education, you ask? Yes, a very special education. The children waved as the nun clapped with a gentle smile. All right, everyone, she said, still smiling. Then in a sudden change of expression, becoming cold and intimidating, she declared, That's enough. It's time to train. The children picked up a series of sharp weapons, daggers, blades, and strangling wires. Ellie, when you're pretending to cry, you don't need to let your nose run. Parents may hate children who look dull or dense the nun said, holding a handkerchief with a cold, intimidating look. Yes, I will remember that. Ellie, the little blonde girl who had been crying earlier, replied, blowing her nose with her hand and a cold expression on her face. From the second floor of the residence, a middle-aged man observed them through a monocle on his face, looking out the window. This kind of education is a gift for them. These children have been trained as weapons since they started walking. They are raised strictly under special disciplinarians. Because of this, it is extremely expensive to raise each child. A muscular blonde woman, wearing camouflage-printed pants, stood in front of a wall filled with various weapons and traps. She stood at ease in front of the children dressed in black uniforms with gloves. What are these children used for, you ask? These children are like computers. How they are used is determined by the buyers, their parents, explained the middle-aged man. The man who had just left with a boy put his hand on the child's thigh, displaying his large gold rings and watches. That's the target. Memorize his face, he said, showing a photo to the boy who watched it carefully. The middle-aged man continued. However, because they are dangerous, security measures have been taken. Certain rules have been impressed upon them since they were young, rules they absolutely cannot disobey. We call these the three absolute rules. The children watched the rules gathered in a large projection room, sitting on the floor. These three rules are designed to ensure that the buyer can control the children. It's crucial that you remember them, the middle-aged man said. Dad, there's a car following us, the child warned, watching the rearview mirror while looking at the target's photo. What? What did you say, boy? The man with warts said, then turned the boy's face, shouting, Shut up and memorize this! The boy immediately responded, Yes, order received, Dad. The father watched, pleased, with his arm around the boy's shoulders as he carefully studied the target's face. The headlights of the pursuing car drew nearer. First, parents' words are absolute. A strong collision occurred, and the car flipped over. The fat man was trapped in his seat, bleeding, and the child remained by his side, blood running from his head. Secondly, they cannot use their power without their parents' permission. The boy touched his father's wrist, searching for a pulse. Two men emerged from the car that caused the accident. One with a pistol and the other, a blonde man who was the target in the photo shown to the boy, carried an assault rifle. Both walked toward the car and found the boy lying outside the door. The boy lifted his head and began to cry, tears mixing with blood, shouting, Help! My dad! He... he's not breathing! Please! One of the men turned and said, Damn! Nobody told us there'd be a kid with him. Should we just get rid of him? As he approached. For what reason? He's just a child. We should drop him off somewhere and leave. 
the blonde man replied, staying further back. And the last and most important rule, the brown-haired man who had approached crouched down and leaned in to speak with the boy, while the child discreetly picked up a shard of glass. Hey, kid. Sorry, but we adults have our circumstances. The man's words were cut off when the boy thrust the shard of glass into his throat. In the event that the parent's safety is threatened, they will ignore the above two rules and resolve the situation. The boy grabbed the man's gun who was clutching his throat, trying to stem the flow of blood. Then hiding behind the body, he passed the barrel of the gun under the man's arm and fired, hitting the target's head squarely. Blood sprayed upward as the man holding the rifle had no time to react, taken down by what he did not perceive as a threat. In his office, the middle-aged man, the father, sat at his desk beneath a crucifix saying, Aren't they such good children? What do you think? Would you like to make a purchase? He opened a catalog with names, photos, and information about the children. A malicious smile spread across his face, with teeth adorned with stones and expensive rings on his fingers. He then turned the catalog towards himself and touching his chin said, Ah, this child. Unfortunately, that's not possible. You could say this child is our only failure. He then stood up and grabbed a file folder, opening it to reveal information about a boy on the table. Over the boy's photo was a red stamp that read deactivated. His abilities were the highest among all our children, a true elite. I was quite fond of him too, but we lost him, or should I say he disappeared. We tried to track him, but the father, now with a grim expression, punched the table in frustration and said, without a parent, he cannot use his power so he won't draw attention. And now he might be living as an ordinary child somewhere, or he might even be dead. In the streets of the city, a boy was crossing the crosswalk with his backpack. Moments later, a fist flew through the air and buried itself in his stomach, making him scream and spit. Wow, that last punch really landed, right, hyun -ho? The boy who threw the punch said, leaning on his knees while the other curled up, stammering and trying to recover. What? What did you say, hyun -ho? Shit, the bully said, approaching with an intimidating look. hyun -ho, a black-haired boy wearing glasses, was sweating with a bruised face from the fight. Scared, he turned around and forced a smile, saying, No! I said fifteen! That punch felt like it was worth 15 points. Touching his stomach, he raised his hand excitedly. Damn, 15 points, that's generous, one of the bullies commented. Yeah, Joseph's punch would definitely be worth 15 points. Another one commented as Joseph high-fived their fourth member. Hyun Ho, leaning on his knees, tried to hold himself up in the corner while thinking, Damn, those bastards. Joseph turned and asked, All right, how many points would a kick be worth? But one of the bullies, a blonde boy, pushed him aside and stepped forward, saying, Me, 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 I want to try too. Then the blonde boy buried his fist in hyun -ho's stomach, who crossed his arms to protect himself. Hey, Huang hyun -ho, how many points am I worth, huh? He asked excitedly. Joseph watched everything in silence with a sly smile on his face. hyun -ho turned to him and said, Fuck you. The boy asked, confused, 52, did I get 52? And looking at him with anger, hyun -ho repeated, No, just fuck you. The boy then shouted, Oh, Park Xion, hyun -ho just told you to fuck off. And one of the bullies replied, hyun -ho's damage gauge is really strict, huh? The blonde continued massaging his hand and complaining, No, it must be defective. Meanwhile, Joseph slowly approached as the others laughed. Damn, Park Xion, that bastard is at it again. I can easily hit you, hyun -ho thought silently. Xion, Xion, what are you doing? Joseph said, stopping in front of him. Then he slapped the blonde, making his face turn, and said, don't act so cocky. I was already hitting him, wasn't I? You get that right? Xian, the blonde boy, clenched his fists and then gave a thumbs up, smiling and touching the cheek that had been slapped. Quan Joseph, seriously, wow, that was a solid hit. I think that's worth 150,000 points? As expected from someone who studied abroad, what do you bench, Joseph? 500 kilograms or like in the US in pounds? Joseph looked at him with a sly smile and then turned away, saying contemptuously as he walked off, Idiot, go buy some cigarettes later, Shion. Cigar Shion was still touching his face when he replied, Oh, sure. See you later. You want menthol, right? As soon as the bully walked away, Shion stood up and fixed his hair, saying, Ah, Quan Joseph, I'll get you next time. Wow, but he really is cool when he speaks with that American accent. Then he threw his arm over Hyunho's shoulder, who looked at him with a cold expression, thinking, Oh, seriously, I really think I could beat him easily. Shion grabbed his hand and tightened hyun -ho's neck angrily, saying, Hey, Huang hyun -ho, wasn't it too much to say fuck you? It was 52 points, right? While hyun -ho thought, Oh, for heaven's sake, you bastard. With eyes full of rage, Shion looked at the boy, squeezing his neck and saying, No, you're coming with me. You're dead today, really. Got it? Later, Shion was eating, shoving sausages into his mouth while saying, 
You're going to buy me all the Taok Baki here. I'm out of money after doing all those tasks for Joseph, Hyunho replied, shyly averting his gaze. Ah, uh, sure, of course, while thinking, that bastard, seriously? Cheyenne wiped his mouth with a napkin and asked, Don't tell me you think it's a waste of money. Joseph is good, but not me, is that it? To which Hyunho replied, No, that's not it. It's just this place. That's when Cheyenne declared, Oh, this place? This restaurant has the same name as yours. Isn't it fascinating as hell? Above them, the small restaurant where they were eating boasted a sign that read, Hyunho's Snack Shop. It was then that Hyunho revealed, This is my mom's restaurant. A friendly-looking lady with brown hair, wearing a red apron, leaned over the counter with a bowl full of food, saying, Oh, you're Hyunho's friend? Eat as much as you want. Have some fish cakes, too. Xi'an picked up a chopstick and said, Is your mom the owner? Ah, so that's why it has your name? And Hyunho, now apprehensive, replied, Yes, it's my mom's restaurant. Tense, he thought. I've managed to keep the restaurant a secret until now. But of all people, of all the people I know, I can't believe I was caught by someone like him. Cheyenne looked at the lady mischievously, licking his lips as if he intended something. Is that so? Then I can't just act like a stranger, he declared, dropping the chopsticks. It was then that Hyunho grabbed a pen and pressed it, popping the tip while thinking, What is he planning to do with my mom? Damn, messing with my mom is crossing the line, Cheyenne said. Auntie. And as if a trigger flipped in his mind, Hyunho moved and raised the pen, ready to bury it in Cheyenne's neck or eyes. But the boy simply bent down in reverence, greeting the lady and saying, Sorry for not greeting you earlier. I'm Hyunho's friend, Park Cheyenne, it's no wonder. The name of the restaurant seemed unique. Hyunho immediately stopped upon realizing he posed no threat. The lady laughed, saying, Really? Hyunho always tells me not to make it obvious. And Cheyenne turned, commenting, Wow, Hyunho, this isn't good. Your mom works so hard for you. Still on high alert, Hyunho thought. No, there's no way to know what he'll do if we stay here. So he took the lead, saying, Ah, mom, we need to go now. Our friends are waiting. The lady, very kind and oblivious to the whole situation, presented a takeout bowl filled with food and said, Really? Well then, Xi'an, how many of your friends are waiting? I packed some tiokbaki and snacks for you to share. Hyunho, desperate, protested. No, mom, you don't have to do that. Xi'an, on the other hand, cheered. Really? For free? And the lady replied, holding the bags. Of course, I don't need to sell anything else today. Xi'an approached her and asked, Wow, are you sure you want to give us all this? And Hyunho's mom said, Sure, it's all fine. In silence, Hyunho watched everything helplessly, thinking, No, mom, please, no. While his mother smiled kindly, thinking she was doing her best, and said, Hyunho's friends are like my children. Repeatedly, he thought, No, mom, please, no, he's not who you think he is. And grabbing the bags from her hands, Xi'an smiled maliciously and said, Oh yes, auntie, all right, then let's enjoy the food. Hyunho walked over to Xi'an and touched his hand, pleading, Xi'an, don't tell Joseph or any of the other guys, please, do me a favor. Xi'an turned and walked away with a smile, saying, Ah, uh, of course, of course, I'll take care of it, I'm leaving now, aunt. The lady waved and smiling said, All right, next time bring your friends too, Xi'an replied while walking. Yes, I'll bring my friends next time. Hyunho clenched his teeth, irritated and frustrated, and asked, Mom, seriously? Why are you doing this? In his mind, he cursed, I'm such an idiot. Then he started yelling angrily, I said not to act like you know me. I said, so why are you doing this? His mother flinched, and he thought, Why am I yelling at my mother, and why is she? The lady lowered her sad gaze and said, I, I just, I was just happy to see your friend for the first time. I'm sorry, Hyunho. She brought her calloused hands together in front of her body. Why are you apologizing? He wondered. I just want you to get along with your friends. I'm sorry. So please don't be mad at me, she said, still in a sad tone. Please stop apologizing. If you keep doing that, I, I, Hyunho thought, clenching his fists tightly and trembling with rage. The next day, a bowl of food and a soaked napkin were placed in front of Hyunho. Holy shit, what the hell is this? Hyunho, your mom sells tiokboki, right? So I bought some, but what is this? Is this a rag? Why is this in the tiokboki? I can't eat like this, Hyunho. Can I get a refund? Joseph said, shoving the napkin in Hyunho's face and sitting at the table while the boy turned his face away, sitting in the chair. Please, or should I go to your mom and say, I'm Hyunho's friend? Joseph said with a smile. Park Shion, I begged you, Hyunho thought, his face covered in sauce. Friend? Are you and I friends? He asked, unable to take the situation any longer. Hyunho, are you mad, really? We're friends, we should get along, it was just a joke. 
Joseph said with a cold gaze. Then he stood up and tipped the bowl, pouring all the food over Hyunho, saying, I can't take it anymore, I'll have to tell your mom everything. Hyunho remained still, covered in sauce, sausages, and napkins, while keeping his gaze fixed on the table and his fist clenched around the pen that would be his weapon. Until, in a fit of rage, he stood up. In a swift motion, with cold and murderous eyes, he brought his hand to Joseph's neck to stab him with the pen. But before he could complete the blow, his mother's voice came to mind. I just want you to get along with your friends. So, I'm sorry. Please don't be mad at me. The pen stopped less than a centimeter from Joseph's neck, who realized what had happened and looked at the boy, who was now shaking uncontrollably, gritting his teeth. The table, the floor, Yuno's body, everything was dirty, the tension was palpable, and everyone in the room watched in disbelief. What the hell? Damn, Huang Yunho. What the hell are you trying to do, man? Joseph shouted, banging on the table in anger. Hyunho, what are you doing? Xion said as he entered the room. But his speech was interrupted when he noticed what was happening. Joseph's friends were guarding the door, and the other students were sitting at their desks, facing forward. Police were present, as was the school principal. There was blood on the floor and a broken window. Hyunho's glasses were crushed, and blood splattered on the books, a trail of violence extending out. That day, Hyuno was beaten continuously for about 15 minutes. He passed out several times and regained consciousness from the pain over and over again. Each time, he would apologize and beg, saying he was sorry. But the violence did not stop, nor did anyone intervene to put an end to it. One of his fingers was broken, and he clasped his hands, pleading. In the end, the one who put an end to the violence was himself. Looking out the window, he saw a stone with the words, You can do this alone engraved on it. And then, in the face of his endless suffering, he threw himself out. Another day at a bully meeting spot, Joseph smiled while smoking and giving some instructions. I have a good idea. About Hyunho, let's say you guys pushed him while playing. You understand what I'm saying? One of the boys protested. But we didn't do anything. And Joseph said, come on, don't be like that. I asked my dad, and apparently there's a good law in Korea. Juvenile law, was that it? I was held back a year, so it doesn't apply to me. That's why I'm asking for your help. You go and turn yourselves in. Say you pushed Hyunho, got it? He showed a page with printed legal information and the boy seemed to hesitate. I, I know about the law too, but I heard we could still be sued for damages, right? Joseph touched his shoulder with a smile and said, Don't worry, there's a way to get around that too. Sued? That hasn't happened yet. As long as there's no one to file a lawsuit, it's no problem, right? It's no pro- Come on guys, even if you get caught, you're protected by juvenile law, right? The boys seemed reluctant and said, even so. That's when Joseph kicked a suitcase that was in the corner of the room and said, I'm not asking for your help for free. Ten million one per person deal. And several bundles of money spread across the floor. Now who knows where Han Ho lives? At his home, Hyun Ho's mother was crying over her son's condition, sitting on the floor, curled up. Arriving at the building, the group of bullies was wearing masks and hoods. Joseph, ironically sporting a tattoo that read Jesus on his arm, asked, what floor was it again? And one of the boys replied, fifth floor. The boys stopped in front of the elevator, but soon noticed something was off and complained, what's going on? Why isn't the elevator coming from the fifth floor? Joseph climbed a few steps and declared, forget it. Let's use the stairs. Leading the group up, he called out, hurry up, we're almost there. Then when they finally reached the fifth floor, they understood why the elevator hadn't arrived. A fire extinguisher was blocking the door from closing. What the hell is this? Joseph asked. Then a voice came from the next flight of stairs. Why are you so late? You made me wait, Cheyenne said, leaning on his knees, wearing a blue hood with a serious expression. Park Cheyenne, what are you doing there? Joseph questioned. Great, right on time. You're coming with us too, one of the boys declared. Cheyenne, however, stood up and said, I'm only going to ask you two questions, so be brief. How did you find out about Hyunho's snack bar? That was my secret hiding place. Joseph took off his mask and smiled as he answered. Ah, that? I was curious why you didn't bring the cigarettes and were eating with the neighborhood kids. And what do you know, our dear Huno was arguing with his mom in front of the snack bar. Xion came down the stairs and said, that was because of me. So here's the second question, and I need you to answer this carefully. What are you doing here? Hitting the pipe on his shoulder, Joseph declared, isn't it obvious? We're here to see Hunho's mom who's sleeping peacefully after filing a lawsuit against us. Perfect timing. I've been annoyed with you this whole time. Do you think I didn't notice? That you were just pretending to intimidate him, but were actually helping that scumbag Hyunho? You've probably taken me for a real idiot this whole time. Joseph tightened his grip on the iron bar, with a look of hunger for violence on his face. All right, that's enough for me. 
Cheyenne said, crouching down and grabbing the fire extinguisher that was blocking the elevator door. Screw you, Joseph yelled, charging at Cheyenne with the bar already raised to strike. Thanks for confirming that. I expected this, but I needed to be sure, Cheyenne said, removing the safety from the extinguisher and activating it, spraying all the contents into Joseph's face. What the hell? What are you doing? Get him, Joseph yelled as the area filled with smoke and visibility dropped. Suddenly, the fire extinguisher flew into the face of one of the bullies. Xion had thrown the object, knocking the kid down, who fell onto Joseph. Move, you stupid bastards, the leader shouted, rolling the other one aside, trying to untangle himself. Xion beat one of the boys repeatedly with the extinguisher, caving in the guy's face and breaking his bones at the end of the staircase. You son of a bitch, Joseph yelled, striking Xion with the pipe, which was blocked by the extinguisher. Cheyenne swung the extinguisher and smashed it into Joseph's foot, causing him to scream, Ah, wait, it's broken, as he fell down the stairs, blood seeping from his foot. The area around them continued to fill with smoke, and visibility was low. I think it's broken, damn it. I'm telling you I heard a weird sound, you idiot, Joseph now shouted from the bottom of the staircase in front of the elevator. It's the metatarsal bones above your cuneiform bone that are broken. You won't be able to walk now. Shion replied, descending the stairs slowly. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this to me? Joseph asked, dragging himself as his foot bled. The three rules imprinted on children. First, the words of parents are absolute. Second, without parental permission, you must not use your power, Shion stated, burying a punch into Joseph. What is he talking about? One of the boys asked, crawling with a bloodied nose. And the most important, the third, Shion began to explain, grabbing Joseph by the collar who now had broken teeth, a black eye, a swollen face, and was bleeding, pleading, Please! Sa! Spare me! I'm sorry! I'm sorry! Please stop! Then Shion took Joseph's hand and said, In the case of parental safety being threatened, ignore the two above rules to resolve the situation. And then he bent Joseph's pinky back, breaking it in the same way Hyunho had his finger broken. Joseph fell, screaming in a deplorable state, and Shion continued, Hyunho's mother said, Hyunho's friends are like my children! That means you threaten my mother, and that means I can crush you to hell. You understand, right? And then, Cheyenne raised his foot and buried it into Joseph's face repeatedly. Back at the large residence where the children were raised, the director authorized, Yes, come in. A nun entered the room with a cell phone saying, Director, there's a call from Korea. The father turned slightly and asked, Korea, who is it? The blonde nun replied with a neutral expression, It's the White Tiger Task Force. The father then turned completely around and said, Oh, them, hand it to me. Then on the phone he answered, Yes, this is the director speaking. And someone on the other end said, I think we found it. The lost legend of the dead mansion. Codename Sean is in Korea. Codename Sean. Among the children raised by the dead mansion, he was the best work. Working undercover, skilled with weapons and assassination to complete everything, he was a product on a completely different level in every way. Therefore, he was to be sent to a Yakuza family that was one of our main clients. But there was a mistake in the delivery. Instead of Japan, he was sent to Korea. Little Sean approached a person in Korea with tears in his eyes, speaking Japanese, not understanding where he was. It's been five years since then. I gave up thinking he'd be dead, but the priest spoke with his forehead resting in his hands. Ah, father, to think you would return him to me, he declared, raising his gaze and breaking into an insane smile. Then go find him, no matter what you have to do. Understood? Rachel, he commanded and the nun removed her robes, revealing a scar on her forehead and white hair. Still with a neutral expression, she replied, Yes, I will initiate the collection process immediately. The nun let the habit fall, revealing a tight leather outfit and high heels, now holding two weapons with supply belts strapped to her thighs and a crucifix hanging around her neck, she said, If something goes wrong, I will use force. This was the trainer of the dead mansion, Rachel. Responsibility and specialty, unknown at the moment. The priest looked at her and declared, what are you saying? Bring him back without hurting him too much. Also, leave your weapon here. That's excessive. Rachel bent down, placing the weapon on the ground and carefully picked up her habit again. In front of Hyono's mother's snack shop, a man was deeply bowing, saying, I am Joseph's father, Kwan byung -woo. I have no excuses. It was my fault for not teaching him better. I promise to cover Hyunho's treatment costs, his mental care, and anything else you request. The student snacking moved away upon noticing his presence, and Hyunho's mother continued cooking without turning around, then replied, Nothing will change even if you do that here, since it's not something that can be resolved with a simple apology. 
Byung Wu remained bowed for a while in silence in his suit, and then raised his head, revealing a face quite similar to Joseph's and saying, Ah, it didn't work? Well, that's fine, I'll leave, and immediately turned away. What? Is that it? The woman asked, incredulous. And then Byung Wu raised a handkerchief to cover his nose with a glassy look and said, Hyun Ho's mother, believing in efficiency is the most important thing in everything we do, but seeing that you have no intention of negotiating, I have no reason to waste my time. Continuing to waste it, I have many other options I could spend it on. Besides, that's what I specialize in. He then walked to his car where his private driver was waiting, holding the door. On the road, he continued speaking. My nose is burning, all this dust and smell. How is she doing business in a place like this? Just tear the place down and build a new building. Oh, what's the state of that boy? Did you take care of that? The driver glanced slightly while still driving and replied, Yes, Assistant O is taking care of it. He should be finishing now and should be calling. With a glazed look, Byung Wu stared out the window and continued the journey in silence. At the hospital, Joseph was lying on the stretcher with his foot bandaged. His face was covered in bandages and he cursed. That bastard! I knew something was wrong with him. He was talking about the three principles that were engraved in him. His father turned to the nurse beside him and asked, Three principles? Is that something that's in fashion among kids nowadays? The nurse shook her head and the boy continued, I don't know either. After saying that, he suddenly... Then Byung Wu raised his hand and said, Oh, wait, wait, miss, can you leave us alone for a moment? It'll be very quick. The nurse turned and left the room. Uh, dad, that bastard. Joseph began to speak but was interrupted by his father who buried his hand in his face with a slap, making him spit. Quan Joseph, do you know what I'm more angry about? If you intimidated kids, what led you to jump out of the classroom? I don't care about any of that. If you went to his house to settle things, you should have handled it cleanly. Then Byung Wu leaned over the stretcher with an insane smile and a glazed look, raising his finger and saying, the basic rule of the job is not to do the same thing twice, Joseph. You should take this chance to learn properly. That's how adults deal with things. Elsewhere in the city, Xi'an was getting beaten up by a group of men near an abandoned site. Lift him, one of the men said, wearing gloves while the others grabbed Xi'an by the arms. Gentlemen, what are you? The man approached and slapped Xi'an's face, turning his head. Then he kicked a bag on the ground. Things aren't going as you planned, right? Just like when you beat up four kids your age. The man said, taking off his gloves, standing in front of Cheyenne, who was now lying on the ground. But it doesn't work the same way with adults, he said, throwing the gloves on top of Xi'an. The young master got a bit crippled because of you, so you should regret it too, right? The men held him down, raising his arm, and then the leader who was speaking lifted his foot and kicked his arm, breaking it. Cheyenne screamed in pain, and the man looked down at him with superiority, saying, This is how adults deal with things, kid. The group left, and after a few moments... Cheyenne got up and with a quick movement, put his arm back in place and mocked, This is how adults deal with things, my ass. Then sitting on a box and massaging his shoulder, he said, Nonsense. You can't even distinguish between a broken bone and dislocated joints. Something like this doesn't even come close to Rachel's punishments. Then observing his trembling arm, he thought, On top of that, things got complicated. I can't use all my strength without orders due to the three principles. Well, this should be enough to calm things down. If not... I'll have to come up with a new identity. However, that's so troublesome. Shion picked up the bag that was on the ground, which the man had kicked earlier, and put it on his back, starting to walk when someone called out to him on the street. Is that Shion? Is it you? But why do you look like that? Hyun Ho's mother had found him. She was wearing a coat and carrying a shopping bag. Hello, Shion replied, stammering while thinking. It just got even more troublesome. Hyun Ho's mother took him to her house and served a meal. Cheyenne remained silent, playing with the sausages for a few moments until the woman approached with more food and said, Cheyenne, you don't need to be polite. I'm fine, so eat plenty. Cheyenne's eyes widened, thinking, the command eat plenty. He immediately began to devour the food voraciously, thinking, as expected, I think of Yunho's mother as my own. The woman stopped beside him and said, this kid? At this pace, you're going to choke. Drink some water. Cheyenne immediately responded, yes and took the bottle of water to his mouth, drinking it all down. Our protagonist devoured all three dishes that had been served, and now, with a swollen belly, he leaned back in his chair. Thank you for the meal, he said. Hyun Ho's mother continued slicing and cooking with her back turned as she replied, I'm glad to see you like this. Shion rested his arms on the table and asked, Is Hyun Ho getting better? The woman hesitated and replied, Hyun Ho, of course, Hyun Ho is fine. The doctor said the surgery went well and we just need to keep an eye on him. You know how strong our Hyun Ho is, right? 
So even though he's going through tough times now, he will get through it. But I, Hyunho's mother began to tremble, and tears dripped onto the counter as she spoke. It seems I can't handle this. When my son is like this, I can't do anything about it. I just want to destroy everything. Just like the pain in my heart, the father of that bastard. I want to tear him apart. She slammed her fist on the counter with all her strength, venting her frustration. Shion listened in silence, and after a few moments the woman composed herself and turned slowly, saying, I'm sorry, Shion. I'm really sorry. I know it shouldn't be like this, but when she turned around there was no one at the table. The space was empty. Shion? She called, searching for the boy who had vanished, leaving only dirty dishes behind. In a luxurious building, Joseph's father was giving a speech, holding a glass. With this, we will finalize the quarterly report for the third quarter. All of you have worked hard. Our construction company, Byung Woo, is on this stage because of all your efforts. You didn't falter, even when the parent company, Jo Young Constructions, went bankrupt. He was speaking from the mezzanine. A waiter approached a man sitting at the table in an expensive suit and said, Would you like more wine? To which the man replied, Yes, serve me. And then he was served with a bottle of wine smashed in his face. Of course, enjoy it, Will, Xi'an said smashing the bottle in the man's face. What's wrong with this brat? Another man said, getting up and trying to defend himself, but Xion quickly grabbed two beer mugs that he was carrying on the tray and shoved them into the man's hands, immobilizing his fists. Are you good at running around? The man asked, trying to threaten him, but when he noticed his hands, he asked, Huh, when did the cups? Xion kicked the man, breaking the mugs against his face. Xion grabbed utensils from the table, and just as another man shouted, There, get that blonde kid! Shion buried them in his eyes, throwing them. What? What is all this noise, Ni? The security guards asked. Lights! Turn on the lights! Another guard ordered. What? Which bastard was it? One of the men asked. It's the blonde kid. Find him. He can't have gone far. He must be around here somewhere. Byung Wu listened to everything and repeated, Blonde kid. Shion slowly stretched his hand under the table, holding knives. Children like dead mansion. First principle. The words of parents are absolute. In his mind, Hyunho's mother's words resonated. Just like the pain in my heart, the father of that guy, I wanted to tear him apart. The security guard screamed, my ankles, while Shion held the bloodied knife tightly, saying, she said she wanted to tear them apart. Another guard appeared, shouting, there, and Shion pulled the tablecloth off the table, sending the objects flying towards them. Then he threw the table in their direction and jumped, using it as a shield. The table landed on top of the guards, crushing them one on top of the other. A knife flew toward Shion and he dodged, lifting the table as one of the guards got back up and was hit squarely by the knife. Oh my, dodging that isn't bad, but I'm sure I broke that arm of yours. Anyway, this time, the man who had beaten Shion said while putting on his gloves. However, Shion charged forward at full speed, burying his fist in the man's face. Then he declared, watch closely, this is how you break an arm. Quickly wrapping his arms around the man's arm, he broke it, creating an exposed fracture near the elbow. The man screamed, falling to the ground with his arm twisted. Xi'an stood tall as a projectile crossed the line above his head. He then turned around, realizing something had been thrown in his direction. Oh, this is harder to aim than I thought, Byung Wu said, holding a gun. It'll be quite difficult to hit at that distance without being a professional, Xi'an said calmly. Really? You seem well informed. So, are you a professional, kid? Byung Wu descended the stairs and approached Xi'an. I heard that kids in Korea do this team thing or something like that. Are you part of it too? Then he got closer with the gun pointed at the boy, who kept his hands raised. Team? I don't know about that, but if you were to ask what I'm affiliated with, Hyunho's diner? Xi'an replied, his clothes bloodied. Diner, Hyunho? The cheap diner on that stinky street? He asked, tilting his head. I finally get it now. So what did that woman say? Did she ask you to kill me or something? Byung Wu asked, pressing the gun barrel against Shion's forehead, who coldly replied, No, she told me to tear you apart. Shion disarmed Byung Wu by burying a punch in his face and pulling his hand. What? You bastard? Is this revenge for them? Byung Wu said, holding Shion's collar, to which Shion responded, This isn't something like revenge or retaliation. First principle, our protagonist launched a series of punches at Joseph's father, who lost teeth and bled more and more as he said, The command of parents is absolute. Xi'an began to walk away, and Byung Wu spoke. Efficiency. It's the most important thing when we're working. We can't do the same thing twice. I knew. You. And that woman. I should have handled this properly. Back then. Next time. I'll kill. All of you. 
The man had a swollen face and was bleeding from his nose. Xi'an grabbed the gun, and now with his clothes hanging off one shoulder, he said, Why are you saying pointless things? Third principle. When there's a possibility of parents being in danger, overcome the current situation, Xi'an fired at the ceiling without looking back, hitting the chandelier's chain and bringing it down. Like father, like son, they're just alike, Xi'an said with a tattoo on his back as the heavy central chandelier struck Byung Wu's body and crushed him. Back at the hospital, a nurse was taking care of Joseph. Dear patient, are you feeling uncomfortable anywhere? She asked, injecting a liquid into the IV bag. Joseph, covering his eyes, replied, Can't you see? Damn, the nurse continued. They say school violence is really scary these days. This is the first time I've seen someone so hurt. I guess the guy who hit you is really good at fighting? Still, this is too much. Observing the nurse's figure, Joseph responded, Yeah, it hurts a lot. The nurse turned with another needle and said, Hang in there. But you know earlier, what were you and your dad talking about? The three principles. You mentioned something like that. Then she injected a purple substance into the IV bag. Joseph propped himself up on his elbows and asked, Uh, that medicine, what is it? The color looks strange. The nurse removed her mask and declared, Oh, don't worry. You won't die if I only use half. Did you know? Then removing her wig, she revealed herself to be the nun sent from the mansion. Trainer Rachel from the Dead Mansion, responsible for and specialized in disguise, infiltration, as well as interrogation and torture. Sometime later, the nun was speaking on the phone at the location where Joseph's father's massacre had occurred. Director, we have a problem. Codename Sean used force. The priest stood up, startled. He used force. What do you mean? Rachel stepped on a guard who had survived, saying, We tracked Sean and arrived at the location, but he had already left. Moreover, there were many seriously injured adult men at the scene. Even if it was Sean, this should have been impossible because of the three absolute principles. She crouched down and carefully examined the body. This doesn't make sense. This has never happened in the history of our dead mansion. That's why it's called the three absolute principles. Rachel, if Sean is indeed breaking the three absolute principles, then something is wrong. My God, these weapons we sold at the dead mansion. They might disregard their orders and aim at us instead. Rachel, we need to change our objective. Go investigate Sean first. Keep a close watch on him and find out if he really used force without permission, the priest ordered, now holding Sean's file. Yes, understood, Rachel replied, stepping on a guard's stomach. If you need any support in Korea, you can ask for help from the White Tiger Task Force, the priest declared. Two men entered the scene, one bald, combing the remaining hair with a small comb, and a large man in glasses smoking. What is all this? All of this was done by an elementary school student? The big guy asked. Yeah, dealing with this situation is going to make me lose my hair, the bald man said with a laugh. Yeah, I found the smoker and the barcode head. I'm going to start watching him after I leave the location, Rachel said on the phone, walking toward the men. I only heard barcode. What should I do? The bald man asked. Rachel ignored both of them and turned away, still fiddling with her phone. What do these kids today call these clothes? The big guy asked, and the bald man pointed with his comb, saying, They said it's Russian. They are open-minded, the other responded. My wife was also open-minded. By the way, our manager is always out at times like this. Is he still in menopause? And the bald man replied, Well, the boss gave him another job. Another job. The next day, the nun entered Cheyenne's school in disguise. Sean, I have completed my preliminary investigation on you. You attend an elementary school here. Your parents are abroad on paper. A student waved and smiled. Hi, teacher, as he saw her pass by. And she returned the greeting while thinking. But they are actually unidentified fake parents. Codename Sean. What are you doing here? I will figure it all out. I am looking forward to this. How our Sean has grown. Sean, you were the best of all the children I taught. You handled all the weapons I taught perfectly. I can't believe you grew up independent of a mission. Here it is, Sean's classroom. She stopped in front of the classroom and saw Cheyenne slumped in a chair, boasting with an arrogant smile on his face. I'm telling you, that bastard Quan Joseph did this. Then he clasped his hands in a prayer position and began to mock, pretending to cry. Cheyenne, I'm sorry, uh, it was all my fault. Rachel was taken aback and thought, what, is that Sean? That vulgar child is really Sean? The others looked at him dejectedly as he continued boasting. That's why I told him, hey, Quan Joseph. Don't think too highly of yourself or you'll really die. It was then that the boy behind him got angry and stood up saying, My God, you're so loud. Damn, let me sleep. Cheyenne gritted his teeth and replied, What did you just say? Both stood up, and Rachel observed everything through the window, thinking carefully. Damn, wait, is this a hierarchical fight? 
There were times like this in the dead mansion, too. A fight to establish a hierarchy of strength. It was adorable how they even tried to fight me. Right, whenever they fought, Sean always came out as the strongest. However, as soon as the fight started, with just one blow, the boy had already knocked Cheyenne down, who was now curled up on the floor. He was the strongest? What happened? Rachel wondered, confused. Wait, I said wait, I'm sorry, you broke my bones, Cheyenne said, trying to protect himself as the boy stepped on him repeatedly. Rachel bit her lip, frustrated, and continued with her disguise. Later, inside the classroom, she declared, All right, let's look at the next paragraph, teaching Xian's class. That's right, this is a school, she thought while maintaining her teacher persona, saying, Here the narrator is. In her mind, she observed Xian's posture and thought, You can't show your strength carelessly if you're trying to hide your identity. Does that mean he is still under the influence of the three principles? Should I observe a little more? Those eyes, that focused look. You're right, I knew it. You are different, Sean. In the dead mansion, good children weren't just strong, but also intelligent. Sean, you have always been the most remarkable child. You can hide your power, but you can't hide your brilliance. In these cases, how problematic. You should at least try to hide this if you're trying to blend in. When I get the chance, I should teach. Upon arriving next to Cheyenne with a proud expression, having finally confirmed that he was her pupil, she found what he was working on. A childlike drawing made of stick figures that seemed to emulate the moment he hit Joseph with the extinguisher, with the words, it's when it gets tough. With a frustrated expression, she watched as he played with the pens, as if he had just drawn something wonderful. What are you doing now? You're in class, Rachel shouted, hitting Cheyenne on the head with her rolled up sheets of paper. Rachel took refuge in the staff bathroom and sat on the toilet, removing her disguise with deep frustration, saying, no way, Sean is, Sean is, no way my Sean has become such a stupid child, it's strange. His face definitely matches, but I can't feel any shadow of elegance in him. Was all of this a coincidence? There's no way such an immature child could be Sean. She held her head tightly and pressed her lips, refusing to believe it. Then standing up, she declared, change of plans. This is no longer a matter of protecting the three absolute principles. She tightened her hair, creating a new hairstyle with her wig, and then exited the bathroom with a new disguise a high school girl with long brown hair and glasses. I must first find out if he really is codename Sean, she said. Ow, it hurts a lot. That teacher usually doesn't hit that hard, Cheyenne said, massaging his head as he walked down the street. Rachel was now behind him, walking as a teenage girl from the same school. In case you're not Sean, know that you will die by my hands, kid, she thought. Xi'an, where are you going? A cheerful woman's voice called out to him. Oh, you know's mom, he exclaimed upon seeing her. We meet again. You arrived just in time. Can you help me carry this? She asked, and she unhurried to walk over to her. Yes, ma'am, I'll carry it. The woman quickly replied, Thank you, Xi'an. And while you're there, eat some teokbalki. And Xi'an responded, smiling. Yes, thank you for the food. Rachel watched out of the corner of her eye, thinking, Who is this person? Xi'an was eagerly devouring the food when the lady turned and said, Oh my God, eat slowly, with a smile on her face. And promptly, Xi'an replied, Oh, yes. Next to Cheyenne, Rachel also had a bowl in front of her while pondering. Here, too, I heard about this old lady from Joseph. He put this old lady's son in a coma. But what's Cheyenne's relationship with her? She turned and observed Cheyenne, who was eating, making a mess all over. Vulgar. You are very vulgar. The more I look, the more vulgar you become. Indeed, you are not Sean. How could you seem so vulgar when you share the same face as Sean? The girl only put a piece of food in her mouth to justify her presence there, but immediately screamed, spitting, Spicy! Water! Here! She said, fanning her mouth with a hot red face. Oh! Here, drink this! You can't handle spicy food very well, can you? The lady said, offering a cup and a bottle of water to the girl. Can't handle spicy? Are you kidding me? This is torture? People eat this? They're crazy? These crazy Koreans! This should be considered poison or maybe even murder, Rachel thought, drinking the water and then wiping her mouth. You should have eaten slowly. You're really clumsy, aren't you? Xi'an said, smiling at the girl. With a stern expression, Rachel thought, I will really kill this bastard. I will make sure to kill him. Now that I think about it, Sean couldn't handle spicy food. I used to firmly hold his hand back then. He must be having a hard time if he's still in Korea. That's when she noticed that while eating, Xi'an was clenching his hands, trembling. Xi'an, are you okay? The lady asked. Of course, it's delicious, he replied with a smile on his face. Rachel continued to drink water and thought, That kid, is he holding back? How foolish. Just don't eat. Why are you forcing yourself to eat everything served to you? Just don't eat if you're having difficulties. 
but then her eyes widened. Wait a minute, that time. And her mind recalled the scene at the traffic light when Hyunho's mother said, You arrived just in time. Could you help me carry this? And Xi'an immediately responded, Yes, I'll carry it. Then she thought, That time too. The next command came when the woman said, Thank you, Xi'an, and while you're there, eat some tiokbaki. And Xi'an replied, Yes, thank you for the food. Rachel then concluded, That kid, he listens to everything that woman says. In front of her, Hyuno's mother was handing a box to Xi'an, saying, Xi'an, can you help carry this? And Xi'an approached, saying, Yes, of course. Watching closely, she thought, He obeys. Commands. She recalled what she had said on the phone with the priest. Even if it were Sean, it should be impossible because of the three absolute principles. Then she concluded, Right, it's impossible to do all that without any command. However, it's possible that someone instructed Sean to destroy Byungwoo constructions. And the only person who could have done that is this woman. First principle of the dead mansion, a father's words are absolute. That's right. Shion recognizes the old lady as a mother and obeys her orders. Based on this assumption, everything fits perfectly. Shion placed the box that the lady had given him in the requested spot, and Rachel said, Count it, please. Rachel paid, and Hyun Ho's mother said, One moment, let me get your change. Let's see, the change is 15. Rachel then picked up a skewer and thought, So there's a simple way to check this. And she threw it in the direction of the woman. Within seconds, a fork appeared, intercepting the skewer in midair. Xi'an jumped over the counter, sending the plastic stool flying behind him, and Rachel smiled, satisfied, blushing as she thought, as expected. The stool fell to the ground and the lady turned, saying, Oh, you scared me. Then she turned and looked for the two, saying, Xi'an? Miss, you didn't take your change. But there was no one left in front of the snack bar. Elsewhere, Rachel was using another skewer as a knife to strike, saying, Third principle of the dead mansion for good children. If there's a threat to the safety of the parents, ignore the principles and resolve the situation. Shion dodged her strike and threw a punch, which she also blocked. Just finish this already. Are you planning to follow me all day, Rachel? Shion said, grabbing Rachel's hand and standing face to face with her. So it was you, Sean. Long time no see, she declared with a sweet voice and an enchanting gaze. Face to face, Sean said, it's still so strange. Why are you following that lady from the snack shop as if she were your mother? It doesn't make sense for a simple snack shop owner to be a client of the Mansion of the Dead. Sean pretended not to understand and replied, What? I don't know what you're talking about. While thinking to himself, I really caused a big stir, but I didn't expect to be found so quickly. On the other hand, Rachel, in a swift motion, struck him and threw him to the ground. Sean fell, gritting his teeth from the impact of his back and head hitting the floor, while Rachel sat on his waist, saying, Let's go back, Sean. Many clients are waiting for you. A memory was triggered, and Sean thought, Go back, back, to that time? He saw himself small, surrounded by defeated and wounded children, soldiers of the mansion like him who had been defeated in battle. Suddenly, a woman with long black hair and a bloodied face approached, placing her hand on his face and said, Park Cheyenne, that will be your name from now on. Sean opened his eyes again in the present and asked, confused, that memory, what was that? Rachel retorted while still on top of him. What did you say, Sean? Sean frowned, irritated, and headbutt Rachel, throwing her back. Rachel covered her face and held her bleeding nose, then said, Sean, you're not going to go back quietly? And she blew her nose, clearing the accumulated blood. However, when she looked up again, no one was in front of her. Damn, I can't believe they sent Rachel, Sean said running through the alleys to distance himself from Rachel. Who was that? He wondered, recalling the woman who had appeared in his memories. What did you say? You lost him. What do you mean? The priest shouted angrily, filled with frustration. Sorry. I let my guard down for a moment, but I found the woman who was controlling him with the three principles. Rachel declared over the phone, breaking into a bathroom stall and passing in front of a lady who was protesting outside. Wait. Hey. Intrigued, the priest asked, controlling him? While changing clothes, revealing scars and bruises, Rachel replied, From what I observed, Sean seems to consider that woman as his mother. The priest put the phone down on the table and sat down, saying, So, he's following the words of that woman he recognized as his mother. Is that possible? It seems that woman isn't using the three principles. Rachel was putting on a mask as she responded, I need more confirmation but so far it doesn't seem to be the case. 
The priest then declared, Rachel, let's check on that woman first. When opening the office door, Rachel found the protesting lady waiting for her, complaining, here she is, a young woman cutting in line. However, when Rachel stepped out, she had already taken on the disguise of a high society lady, with short white hair, glasses, and luxurious clothing. But she was young before, the lady said, confused, as Rachel walked away. In his office, the priest said, there are two ways to recover a good child from their parents. The first is, Hyunho's mother, dressed in her simple restaurant uniform, asked in surprise, huh? What did you say? And Rachel, in her disguise as a middle-aged woman, replied while adjusting her glasses, I asked you to stay away from Cheyenne, because I'm often away on business trips, I haven't been able to pay much attention to him. But to think that Cheyenne, who can't even eat spicy food, has been eating such low-quality food. As a mother, that really breaks my heart. Rachel played with the food served while speaking. Cheyenne, can't eat spicy food, I understand, Hyunho's mother said. Looking down sadly, Rachel smiled, thinking, that's right, old woman, feel the guilt. How dare you be Sean's mother? And in his office, the priest continued speaking. The first way to recover a good child from their parents is to make the father voluntarily give up custody of the child and order him to return to the mansion of the dead. Rachel stood up and, facing Hyunho's mother, said, I know Cheyenne listens to you, but you also have to take responsibility as an adult. So, if Cheyenne shows up here again, tell him, never come here again and go back home. Tell him confidently. Rachel approached the simple lady, placed her hand on her shoulder, and as she walked away, said, I'll take it that you understood me. I'm leaving now then. However, Hyunho's mother clenched her fists and declared, No, I won't do that. You said you're often on business trips, right? Rachel turned around and retorted, Are you trying to be annoying with that? And Hyunho's mother continued arguing, Did you really look at Cheyenne's face? Cheyenne always wears messy clothes and has a dirty face. Whenever I ask about it, he says he fell somewhere. I really thought that was true. I thought he was a boy who grew up like all the others. My Hyunho always said he fell too. I couldn't let Cheyenne end up like that. So, without realizing it, I started taking care of him whenever I could. Now, Cheyenne needs a mother to take care of him. I can't let him end up like my Hyunho. If you're busy, I will take care of him myself. Tears streamed down her face as she remembered her son and Cheyenne. Rachel got angry and replied, This old woman, who do you think you are, saying you'll take care of him? The lady bowed and said, I'm sorry but I can't comply with your previous request. Rachel gritted her teeth in anger, clenched her trembling fists, and turned to leave. In a remote place, next to garbage cans behind houses, Rachel began the process of changing disguises and contacted the priest. Director, the first attempt failed. The old woman was more stubborn than expected and insisted on her property. The priest took off his glasses and declared, then there's nothing to be done. I wanted to resolve this discreetly, if possible. Proceed with the second method. Rachel smiled satisfied and, while removing her clothes, replied, all right, I'll do it. The second way to recover a good child from their parents is, in the case of the father's death, the good child must return to the mansion of the dead. Rachel said, revealing a black corset with a weapon and stockings. Set the old woman as our target. I'll get rid of her. The next day, at the market, Hyunho's mother was shopping calmly while Rachel secretly observed her, waiting for the perfect opportunity. She then took a detonator in hand and, looking at the lady, thought, Who the hell do you think you are to dare take Sean? Rachel pressed the red button, and in the next room, a bomb exploded. The explosion blew the door away, and everyone was startled. The sprinklers activated, creating steam that reduced visibility due to the fire and water. What's happening? Everyone asked amid the chaos. Hyunho's mother shrank back, confused, and Rachel pulled out her gun, aiming it at the lady and saying, You cannot become Sean's mother. I won't allow it. Rachel fired, but just as the bullet left the gun, Sean appeared with a frying pan, intercepting the projectile. Sean, Rachel said with a look of admiration. I saw this in a game and decided to try it. Did it really work? Sean said, holding the bent frying pan that had been hit by the bullet close to his chest, now leaning against a vegetable stand. I figured you would do this but bombs and guns? Isn't that a bit much? Sean said, tossing the frying pan away and walking towards Rachel, observing her through the checkered fence that divided the aisles. 
Don't interfere, Sean. I'm going to free you from that old woman, Rachel said, aiming the gun again. Sean turned in despair and said, I can't let that happen. He lunged, throwing himself against the gondola and knocking it over Rachel, who ran to dodge. The third principle, you know it without me having to say, right? Sean said, as he kicked Rachel, disarming her. I wanted to bring you back unharmed, Rachel said, pulling out a knife and striking at him. A red substance fell to the ground, and Sean replied, Really? But I don't think I can let you leave unharmed. He held a can of tomato sauce to stop Rachel's knife strike. Sean tossed the can away, causing the knife to be lost, and need Rachel, who dodged, responding, Do you think you can beat me? Didn't I teach you? Then, she swept the boy's legs, knocking him down onto the gondola. Fighting should be a means to an end. This is a supplemental lesson, Sean. Tell me, what is the purpose of this fight? Rachel asked, pulling out a curved knife and cornering Sean, who hit his head on the gondola and remained lying down. Hyunho's mother continued trying to protect herself from all the chaos while the sprinklers poured water over the place. What's happening? She asked confusedly when suddenly she heard a child's cry. Mom? Mom? Where are you, Mom? The little boy cried, sobbing. The lady approached him cautiously, asking, Oh, dear. Child, are you hurt? Still curled up, the little boy replied, I can't see my mom. As he sobbed and tears filled his eyes, he turned and said, I don't know where my mom is. Please help me. It was the same little boy who had been sold at the beginning and had been involved in the car accident. Now he was there, asking for help and holding a knife behind his back. Purpose. Sean wondered while still lying down, then dodged the attack as Rachel buried the knife, trying to hit him. Sean jumped away, creating distance, and Rachel approached him, climbing onto the gondola and striking with the knife. A plan? Sean asked, holding Rachel's hand, to which she replied, That's right, it's a plan to free you. She began to force the blade closer to Sean's face, and as he tried to stop her advance, he looked away, thinking, Could it be? It was then that Rachel let go of the knife with one hand and grabbed it with the other, saying, Oh, you shouldn't get distracted in the middle of a fight. Rachel struck again, making a curve in the air and forcing Sean to dodge. The boy stepped back and grabbed some can goods, thinking, as expected, fighting Rachel with bare hands is too much. He then threw them in the direction of the instructor, who dodged with the knife, saying, as long as we take care of the old woman, you'll be back under the command of the mansion of the dead, since you are our products in the end. Sean then repeated in a cold voice, product? Rachel advanced, laughing and said, now, let's go home together, Sean. Sean took advantage of the moment of distraction to throw a bag of flour in her direction. The woman tore it open without realizing, as the knife attack had already begun. A cloud of flour smoke rose, reducing visibility, and Rachel covered her mouth and nose, cursing, Damn, flour? Just barely. She dodged a sudden attack from Sean, who grabbed a pair of scissors and thrust them toward her face, leaving a cut on her cheek and cutting strands of her hair. The boy continued manipulating the scissors and striking, forcing her to move. That's it, Sean. That's the Sean I know, she said with an excited smile on her face. She attacked with her curved knife, and Sean stopped the attack by opening the scissors. However, no matter how hard she pushed, she realized something. He isn't moving at all, she thought. It was then that Sean suddenly appeared, pushing her and lifting her while saying, You called us products, right? He struck her, throwing her over his head and sinking her into a shopping cart. But what? A place where my family is waiting? Who calls their family products? Sean declared, looking at her coldly. Then, kicking the cart, he said, And speaking of products, you're nothing but one like us. The cart locked into others, and Sean trapped Rachel inside. The instructor was stuck in that ridiculous situation, shouting, Sean! Sean! As Sean walked away, the boy continued crying next to the lady, Hyunho's mother. Oh, my child, are you okay? Are his parents around? She asked, turning to try to find the guardians. The boy seized the moment of distraction and pulled the knife to finish off the lady, and suddenly Sean appeared, shouting, Mom, are you okay? The lady turned and asked, Cheyenne, you shouldn't be in class right now. What happened to your clothes? Did you get hurt again? She asked, next to the boy who quickly hid the knife while thinking, that face. I'm sure. He is the legend of the mansion of the dead, Sean. Sean is here. Does that mean that Coach Rachel has been defeated? Sean approached his mother, genuinely concerned, checking her well-being. Then, seeing that she was okay, he turned and asked, who is this child? To which the lady replied, he said he lost his mother. We should get him out of here first. Sean then bent down and, with a smile, asked, Child, do you know your parents' number? Still with tears in his eyes, the boy replied, Phone number? No, I don't know. To himself, he thought, Facing Sean is too big of a risk. Let's just focus on the target. He then stood up and raised his hands, running towards the lady, saying, Miss, please help me look for my mom. And he kept thinking, First, 
I'll use her maternal instinct to get closer to the target again. Sean, however, touched his shoulder and picked him up with a smile, saying, Come on, kid, you don't need to cry. Then, leaning closer to his face with a low voice and an intimidating look, he said, Haven't you learned that kids with silly faces will be hated? Sean then placed two fingers on the boy's neck, making the sign of a gun with his hand. A gun, the boy thought, wide-eyed. After all, he was still just a child. Stay still. It seems I need to have a chat with the principal. You still have direct contact with him, right? I lost it a long time ago, Sean said, holding him in his arms. Brother, I don't know what you're talking about, the boy replied, still holding the knife hidden in his hand. Look at this child, holding that kind of thing, Sean said, delivering a blow to the back of the boy's neck and knocking him unconscious. The boy dropped the knife, and Sean stepped on the object as his mother turned around. Huh? Did you hear something? Sean then replied, No, I didn't hear anything. The lady approached and saw the boy sleeping in Sean's arms. Oh, he fell asleep? Our protagonist replied, Yes, he must be very tired. The lady, genuinely concerned, asked, Where could his mother be? And Sean quickly took the lead, saying, Oh, it seems the child has a phone. I'll try to call someone. The firefighters arrived on the scene and safely removed everyone. In the mansion, it was still dark. The priest was sleeping when he was awakened by the annoying sound of the landline phone. Damn, who could be calling at this hour? He complained sitting up in bed shirtless, exposing the various tattoos on his chest. Putting on a robe to cover his muscular and tattooed body, he cursed, I told you not to call the direct line. Then, he answered, yes? On the other end, someone said, hello, director. Immediately, the priest's eyes widened, and he smiled, saying, that voice. Sean, is that you? But why are you calling from this number? Sean, now dressed and with a bandage on his face, replied, it seems you sent me a big gift. Did you think you could catch me with just Rachel and a child? Sean watched the unconscious boy on the sofa as he spoke. Rachel and Eugene lost? The priest asked with a disappointed expression. What's with that reaction? It hurts my pride. You know, no matter who or how many you send, the results will be the same. You can keep trying if you want, Sean declared. The priest smiled and said, I thought you would just run away. Are you planning to confront the mansion of the dead head on? Sean then responded in a cold voice. Run away? That's not even funny. If there's a threat to my parents' safety, ignore the principles and resolve the situation. According to the third principle, I will consider the mansion of the dead a threat and will break the current situation. The priest fell to his knees on the floor and smiled, joining his hands in prayer and raising his eyes with a mad expression. Ah, my lord, the gift you blessed me with is purer and more beautiful than anything I have ever seen. It's hard to believe he would be so faithful to the three principles. The priest then lowered his head and replied, Okay, Sean, then let's do this. Send Eugene back and let's not touch the old woman. Sean stood up and looked at the door, saying, after an hour, tell Rachel to come in person. Pressing the phone against his forehead, the priest smiled, saying, ah, Sean, I can hardly believe you would be so pure. We will meet soon, my treasure. Sean poked the sleeping boy's head and said, hey kid, wake up. Eugene quickly sat up and got alert. Sean put his hands on his hips and said, don't even bother looking for the knife. I took it a long time ago. Just sit quietly and eat. You probably haven't eaten anything right? Eugene looked at the food with disgust and replied, who the hell would eat this stuff? Sometime later, Eugene was dirty and pressing his lips together in revulsion. It was good, wasn't it? Sean asked, carrying a black bag and walking alongside Eugene. Actually, no, the boy replied. Yeah, sure. You ate it all, Sean said, remembering the boy devouring the food. Oh, there she is. Sean leaned on the boy's shoulders and said, Eugene, come here. Rachel ordered with a cold look and an intimidating stance. Yes, the boy replied. Eugene climbed the street stairs towards Rachel, and Sean called out, Take this. The kid seemed to like it. He extended the black bag containing a lunchbox. You're pretty relaxed, Sean. I haven't given up on you yet. I'll visit you again soon, Rachel said with a look full of hatred, then turned, taking Eugene's hand. Come on. He's at an age where he should be eating tons, Sean said, watching them leave. Things would have been much easier if you had taken care of that old woman, Eugene, Rachel said to the boy, who replied, I'm sorry but he was interrupted by the woman, who looked at him intimidatingly and said, you will be eliminated from now on. I should have gotten rid of useless children a long time ago. Sean stopped upon hearing that phrase, and the child continued walking beside Rachel, but he was trembling and began to tear up, saying, I'm sorry. Sean climbed the stairs, approaching and smiling, extending the bag. Hey kid, I'll ask one last time. Wasn't it really good? Eugene turned around, with tear-filled eyes and a red face, and replied, it was very good. And Sean then declared, right? That place is really good. So let's go back to Hyunho's diner. 
The property rights of the good children of the dead mansion belong to the buyers, the parents. However, if the parents die, the property reverts back to the dead mansion. Eugene's second father was also murdered, and a new mother adopted him. A lady in luxurious clothing approached, saying, Eugene, I will be your mother from today. She extended her hand, and the boy looked up and replied, Okay. So, the child is redopted and sent to a new family. If the situation repeats, he returns to the mansion, is redopted, and sent to a new family, and then a new family again. Eugene's parents were killed in various ways, poisoning, gunshots, until the director took him for a walk in the garden on a sunny day. Eugene, how many times has it been? Eugene innocently raised four fingers and replied, This is the fourth time. The priest turned around, responding, That was a rhetorical question, Eugene. Of course, we could continue to profit by repeatedly sending you to new families, but you haven't managed to protect your parents four times already. The priest bent down and touched Eugene's shoulder, saying, This is the worst disgrace in the history of our dead mansion. If this continues, we will have no choice but to dispose of you, Eugene. Do you know what happens to children who are disposed of? Eugene acquired a look of panic on his face upon hearing that word, as the conversation took place in front of the mansion's private cemetery. You don't know, Eugene? The priest asked, looking at the gravestones. You need to become someone useful, the priest said as the little boy looked at the gravestones in fear. So, I am giving you an opportunity. Go to Korea and help Rachel get Sean back. If you don't want to be discarded, prove your worth, the priest declared. Next to the boy, Rachel said, you will be discarded from now on, Eugene. That's why we should have disposed of useless children from the beginning. The boy looked up with fear as he thought, Discarded? Am I useless? No, I can't let that happen. I need to prove my worth. Then he spoke, Just one more. If you give me a chance. And Rachel, looking down with disdain, replied, A chance? The boy then lowered his head and said, I'm sorry. That's when Sean came up the stairs saying, Hey kid, I'll ask one last time. It wasn't really good. Rachel smiled and softly said, I'll give you one last chance, Eugene. Kill Sean's parents. It's that old lady. Eugene looked back seeing Sean placing the bag on the ground and thought, last chance. Then he started to speak, tears welling in his eyes. It was, and in his mind, he thought, my last chance to prove my worth. Crying with a red face, he declared, it was delicious. While thinking, I will kill Sean's parents. Sean clenched his fists and said, then, I have to take that kid back. Rachel turned with a smile, thinking, Sean still sees me as a threat. So, the third principle must still apply. She then lowered herself and touched Eugene's shoulders, saying, Didn't we make a deal, Sean? You hand over Eugene, and we won't go after that woman. Sean placed his hand on his hip and gestured, saying, Yes, but the kid just said that, didn't he? He said it was delicious. He's been our regular customer for some time, so I can't help it. Rachel shook her head and asked, Is that how you're going to be? Then she leaned down and spoke close to Eugene's ear. Go ahead, Eugene. This is your last chance. The boy walked up to Sean while Rachel spoke. Then the deal is off, and I'll go after that old lady again. You understand what I'm saying, right, Sean? Sean grabbed the small child's hand, who looked up at him with a vulnerable gaze while he said, Do what you want. I'll just beat you, repeatedly. At Hyunho's mother's house, Sean turned, shouting at the child, Is this what I said? So, why are you here? Sitting at the table with Eugene, there were several dishes in front of them. What do you mean, why? Cheyenne, you said you would take care of the child for a day, his mother said, arriving with another platter of food. Still. Going to your house is a bit, Sean said, with cutlery in hand. It's fine. Do you think you can cook properly on your own? I won't be bored either, so it's good for me as well. Besides, it's really fascinating to think that this boy's mother is a friend of your mother, the lady said with a kind smile on her face, finishing setting the table. I know, right? Sean said, looking away as he thought, well, they're both named Rachel so. The lady then spoke, yes, you might as well stay here. There's no one home, right? Sean raised his arms and shook his head negatively saying, What? No, seriously, that's not necessary. Eugene lowered his head and said, Thank you, aunt. So please forgive us. To himself, he thought, I can't miss this opportunity. The lady was serving bowls of rice, saying, Oh, my head is a mess. Boy, what's your name? And the boy replied, I'm Eugene. Scratching his head, Sean looked away and thought, This is really too much. Thinking about it, it's the first time I'm inside here. Hyunho's house. Sean looked around. Noticing every detail, the windows, the wet sneakers, until he saw a closed door that caught his attention. Is that Hyunho's room over there? He asked aloud. Yes, that's Hyunho's room. Why do you ask? His mother inquired. Can I go in? He said, still observing the door. I spoke as if I were enchanted, Sean thought, entering the room and saying, This is Hyunho's room. Observing the details around him, the desk with the computer, the chair, the bed, the calendar, the games, the curtain, 
It was just a regular room, the kind of room you'd typically see in dramas or movies, with the usual daily life, with normal dreams and efforts, with a normally happy family, those things. On one of the counters, a picture frame with a photo of young Hyunho holding a bouquet of flowers next to his mother. Sean picked up the photo while thinking, maybe because I wished for them so much that I don't understand. Hyunho, who had a normal, ordinary family. Hyunho should have been in this room. He could have been happy, going through normal, everyday moments. I shouldn't have just stood still. In the living room, Eugene wiped his mouth after eating. Thank you for the meal, aunt. Especially the omelet. It was the best food I've ever had. As he wiped his mouth, he thought, now that Sean is gone, this is my chance. The lady laughed and said, omelet? You mean the rolled egg? Eugene then said, but if you don't mind, I have some questions. Smiling, she replied, of course, what do you want to know? The boy reached behind him, searching for a knife, and asked, besides your son, do you have another family? Like, for example, your husband? The lady clasped her calloused hands in front of her on the table and hesitated as she answered, um, how should I explain this? Hyunho's father was, the heavens must have needed him very much. Unfortunately, I had to let him go. Eugene looked down sadly and said, they needed him, so he became a family member up there. The lady smiled and clapped her hands, saying, yes, that's a beautiful way to say it. Eugene then continued, on the other hand, your son couldn't become part of a family anywhere else. The lady, confused, asked, what? And with a cold gaze, the boy said, because a weak failure, a useless child, cannot become anyone's family. Hyunho's mother insisted, what are you saying? Still keeping his head down, Eugene said, a family is where you constantly prove your worth and show every member that you are a valuable presence. If you don't prove it, you're just a burden that consumes resources. A family like that, Hyunho's mother then stood up, banging her fist on the table in frustration and saying, no, that's not how a family works, Eugene. Eugene looked up and asked, then, what is it? And the lady, agitated, began to respond, a family is, but Sean appeared, grabbing the boy from behind and lifting him, saying, are you done eating, kid? Aunt, can we sleep in the living room? While bouncing the child in his arms. Eugene kept a sad expression, and the lady replied, Hyunho's room is empty, why don't you sleep there? Still holding him, Sean said, oh, a sofa, that's good enough for me. Kid, you sleep on the floor? And Eugene shouted, no. Sometime later, Eugene was lying sulking under the covers on the floor, while Sean was sprawled out on the sofa, drooling with his mouth open. Damn, who would have thought he'd actually make me sleep on the floor? The boy complained. Eugene noticed a sliver of light from the door and then got up. Approaching, he realized it was Hyunho's room. The boy's mother was sitting in a chair, lying on the table, holding the photograph. Weird. That old lady is strange. She calls such a useless boy family. And she even makes that face at a stranger like me. When I haven't proved anything, Eugene thought, watching her and remembering the priest's words. You need to become someone useful. A useless child cannot become anyone's family, Eugene. Then he recalled what Hyunho's mother had said. That's not what a family is, Eugene. So, what is it? He wondered. But there was still no answer. Eugene reached behind him, searching for his weapon, and pulled out a gun, saying, I have to prove myself. Then, pointing it at the sleeping lady, he trembled, gritting his teeth and saying, I have to be a family member that someone needs. Suddenly, the ray of light began to diminish, and the door slowly closed. Sean was next to him and looked at him angrily, saying, Was that your final decision, kid? Eugene kept trembling with the gun in hand as he replied, I'm just fulfilling my mission. So please, don't resist. The boy turned the gun on Sean and pulled the trigger. However, nothing happened. Confused, he asked, why didn't the bullet? With a handful of cartridges, Sean said, you took that gun from Rachel earlier, right? I emptied the magazine while you were sleeping. Sean dropped the cartridges on the ground in front of the boy and continued, but aren't you a bit too relaxed? 15 rounds of 9mm Parabellum would weigh 112.5 grams. You should have noticed that the magazine was empty when you picked it up. It looks like you're still an amateur. Sean looked at him with disdain. Angry, Eugene lunged forward, cursing, damn it. The boy pulled out a knife and tried to stab him, but Sean grabbed his arm and dodged. Sean pushed him against the door, but the boy seized the moment to turn the doorknob and open it, leading the fight into the room where Hyunho's mother was. Eugene fell in the center of the room, and Sean made a shushing gesture, saying, hey, hey, let's calm down first, okay? seeing that she remained asleep. But the boy turned around and wanted to take advantage of the opportunity to charge at the lady and finish her right there. That brat, Sean cursed, grabbing a tie that was hanging and using it as a lasso to pull Eugene's foot back. Eugene turned angrily and cut the tie with the knife, then knelt down, saying, Sean. Sean held the tie with both hands and said, wow, that's a scary look you have. Then the boy gained momentum, jumped off the bed, and tried to strike him. 
but Sean used the tie to deflect his hands and body without hurting him. What's wrong, Sean? Are you going easy on me? Fight me properly. The boy complained, charging again. Then Sean quickly yanked the knife from the boy's hand and said, Sure, why not? The boy was confused, but thinking quickly, he shot another weapon toward the lady. Sean deflected the projectile with the knife he had taken from the boy's hands and tripped him, holding him up so he wouldn't fall. He said, Oh no, you shouldn't make noise. Now, get up. We haven't even started. Hanging by his collar, the boy looked at Sean and gritted his teeth. One eye closed, thinking, Is this the difference between me and the legend of the dead mansion, Sean? Then our protagonist continued, Get up, kid. Your attacks are very obvious. Again. But then Sean, the great prodigy of the dead mansion, was hit by a surprise attack. The Unstoppable, the Korean version of the Brazilian Mother's Sandal, a rolled-up magazine. What are you two doing? Are you fighting? Hyunho's mother yelled with a rolled-up magazine in hand, breaking up the fight in a more fought-out manner. No, of course not, mom. It's nothing like that. Sean replied, intimidated. No, my foot. She retorted, still irritated. An opening. The boy thought, picking up the knife from the floor, but Sean turned and, with a cold and intimidating look, said, that's enough. Then Sean hugged him, saying, we're not fighting. This is a morning training. Eugene grabbed the knife and started spinning it between his fingers, saying, yes, that's also a trick. Eugene watched him, thinking, I can't win. I don't have the confidence to kill that old lady in front of Sean. The woman crossed her arms and asked, training? Are you sure you're not bothering him? Laughing and scratching his head, Sean replied, no, I'm just playing with him. With a tense expression, Eugene thought. It seems that a direct confrontation is impossible. So, Hyunho's mother caught his attention, saying, Eugene, you too. He replied, yes. She continued, don't tease your brother too much. In a family, the boy was surprised and then lowered his head again, thinking, they called me family again. He asked, family? Am I part of this family? Sean kept an eye on the boy, suspicious, while the lady bent down and stroked his hair, saying, of course, we eat together and sleep under the same roof. That's no different from a family. The boy remained silent while the lady continued to pet him. He seemed to absorb all of that. Then the doorbell rang, and a girl's voice echoed, Is anyone home? Hyunho's mother walked to the door, asking, Who is it at this hour? Then, she calmly opened the door, asking, Who are you? A young schoolgirl with long blonde hair and glasses bowed, saying, Hello, ma'am. I apologize for coming so early in the morning. I am Eugene's sister, Mary. She broke into a wide smile with a bright aura and then said, Thank you for taking care of Eugene last night. I came here to thank you personally. Sean appeared, leaning against the door and asked, Mom, who is it? The lady turned around, responding, Oh, she says she is Eugene's sister. She must have come to pick him up. Sean turned around with a skeptical smile and said, Oh, really? You're Eugene's sister? Sean stepped out and started talking to the smiling girl outside. So, he had a sister. But why did you come here? She promptly replied, to pick up Eugene, of course. In exchange for Eugene, we guarantee your mother's safety. That was the promise, right? Sean stepped closer and was inches away from the girl, asking with an intimidating expression, who ordered the kid to kill? The girl, blushing and with a sweet voice, brought her hand to the side of her mouth as if telling a secret and replied, smiling, don't worry, that was an arbitrary order from Rachel. And you caught him, didn't you? Sean then declared, oh, is that so? Then could you get rid of your machete first? The girl stepped back, touched her cheek with her hands, smiled, and said, wow, you're quick to notice. As long as you cooperate, nothing will happen. Sean recoiled and said sarcastically, I I'm so scared. I wonder what happens if I don't cooperate. Eugene appeared, smiling happily, and said, sister, why did you just come now? He ran into the girl's arms. Eugene, good to see you, she said, bending down to hug him. The siblings seem close, Sean said, walking over to his mother. Oh my God, you're right. The lady replied, delighted. The girl was still holding Eugene when she whispered in his ear. Unfortunately, it seems like you failed. The director will be very disappointed. You could really be discarded this time. Smiling innocently, the lady said, Both Mary and Eugene have beautiful names. With a sad expression, Sean said, Hey, kid. But he didn't turn around. Still hugging his sister, the boy whispered in her ear, What are you saying? After you ruined my whole plan. She then asked, Me? The plan? He pulled away from the girl's arms and said, since I'm an amateur, I was looking for an opportunity to win over this family. The girl looked at him with a stern expression and asked, Hmm, are you making excuses? He averted his gaze, replying, Excuses? Don't be absurd, Mary. This mission isn't that simple. That man, the legend of the House of the Dead, Sean, is taking care of it. Sean turned to Hyunho's mother and said, Go ahead and come in, Mom. But the lady insisted, No, 
I want to say goodbye to Eugene. Eugene kept talking to the girl. He's ugly, stupid, and his face looks like a monkey's butt. I fought him face to face. He's extremely strong. Mary watched closely, adjusting her glasses and declared, I think you're right, especially about his face description. Sean heard everything, and a vein popped in his neck from anger at the insult. Please, just come in first, Mom. I want to have a good talk with them, Sean insisted. Sorry, Eugene. It seems I messed up your mission. I admit it. But don't worry, we have another mission prepared for you. So, why don't we step back for now, Eugene? Mary said, reaching out her hand to the boy with a wide smile on her face. Okay, the boy replied. Taking his sister's hand, Mary turned and said, We're leaving now. And Hyunho's mother said, Oh my God, you're already going? Mary raised her hand and waved, saying, So, until next time, Cheyenne. Eugene quickly turned and pulled her, saying, Let's go. With his shoulders slumped, he continued walking until the lady's voice cut through the hallway. Hey, Eugene, come back another time. I'll make an egg. I mean, an omelet. And with a sly and subtle smile, Eugene replied, Yes, I'll come. Sean was leaning against the wall next to the door watching everything when his mother declared, Cheyenne, if you bring Eugene back again, I'll make something delicious for you too. And with shining eyes, in the same tone as when he received an order, he replied, Yes, I'll make sure to bring him again. The next day, in the principal's office at the school, the principal was talking to Hyunho's mother. A chubby man in a suit, bald and wearing glasses, was wiping sweat from his brow as he spoke. Ma'am, I'm sorry to give you this news like this. We were going to discuss the perpetrators and their punishments with the school violence committee. Then, there was a small delay. The parents of the perpetrators promised to provide compensation, and all the perpetrators will be suspended. Hyunho's mother, sitting in front of him, was quiet and downcast, only replying, I understand. He picked up the black folder that was on the table in front of him and said, this file contains the photos of the perpetrators. Would it be better if you didn't see them? However, something caught her attention. This photo. Why is it here? She asked, picking up a photo from the folder. What do you mean? The principal asked, wiping sweat from his brow. Why is Cheyenne's photo here? She asked, turning the photo of Park Cheyenne, Sean, which was in the folder of people who bullied her son. Back at the mansion of the dead, the director watched the sunset through the stained glass window. How did this happen, Rachel? He asked, hands behind his back. I apologize, director. I ordered Eugene to kill that old woman, but honestly, Rachel said over the phone, sitting in a chair. She looked at Eugene, who was kneeling beside her with a look of disdain. As expected, he is just a useless child. To think he is incapable of carrying out even a single order correctly. The director retorted, That's not what I'm asking, Rachel. She asked, What? And the director replied, I told you, to retrieve Eugene and leave that old woman alone. But you ordered Eugene to kill that woman? Mary stood up, sipping a cup of hot coffee while speaking on the phone with the director. That is, Rachel tried to respond, still with a scarred and calloused body from the fight with Xi'an. Aren't you the one failing to carry out my orders correctly? The director asked, holding his crucifix between his fingers like a knuckle duster, with a look of anger in his eyes. That was for Sean's recovery, Rachel replied, while Mary sat in front of a variety of cell phones and began typing cheerfully. I place great importance on promises, Rachel regardless of who the promise was made to. Before God, there must be only faith and trust. Everything else is heresy, the director responded, standing before his altar with a look of insane devotion. However, since there are children who lack faith, I had no choice but to create a control measure called the three principles. Try to remember, Rachel, the consequences of uncontrollable and unexpected events from the past. As the director spoke, Rachel thought of the scar etched on her forehead. Do you understand? Orders. Principles promises. These are the absolute rules of our mansion of the dead. The director finished speaking and Rachel lowered her head, declaring, Amen. But what about Sean's recovery? Are you really going to give up just like that? The director replied, Don't worry about that. There are many ways to handle this without directly touching that old woman. Mary has already started the operation. While they talked, Mary continued typing on various cell phones, spreading photos of Cheyenne in several different chats, and sending rumors with a smile on her face. Xion arrived at school and opened the doors, yawning. As he walked through the hallways, he noticed glances and whispers. Everyone seemed to be watching him and avoiding him at the same time. When he sat down at his desk, he turned to the boy next to him and asked, What's going on? Why is everyone acting so strange? Do we have a test today? Come on, why aren't you answering? It was then that some bullies sitting behind him tapped him on the shoulder, calling out, Hey Park Xion, is this true? One of them said, holding up a cell phone. What? Cheyenne asked, turning around. The bully stretched out his hand and showed the phone, displaying an image of Cheyenne putting a chokehold on Joseph. 
the same image Mary had sent to the groups earlier. I'm talking about this photo, he said. Shion looked, still confused, and thought, what the hell is this low-quality edited image? He asked, where did you get something like this? The bullies exchanged glances and then all stood up, bowing in unison and saying, sorry, Shion, we were wrong all along. Shion turned around confused as they spoke. Is it true that you beat up Joseph and made him act like your subordinate? Our protagonist was startled and asked, what, my subordinate? The bully held out the cell phone again, showing the image and saying, yeah, the rumor has spread all over the school. Even Joseph is afraid of you. Shion looked in disbelief, thinking, do they really believe this nonsense? Seriously? The bully changed the image and showed a photo of Shion posing next to two tattooed adult men, shirtless. They even say you're friends with gangsters, he said. Shion looked shocked at the image and then exclaimed, what the hell, isn't this going too far? It was then that the bully leaned in and spoke with a smile. Besides, they say you asked Joseph to take care of that kid named Hyunho. Shion looked at them, even more shocked and could only stammer, what? What are you talking about? This? Then Shion stood up and banging on the desk shouted loudly, that's not it. I didn't do any of that. However, seeing that no one seemed to care, he just repeated to himself, Hyunho is, that's not true. That's. One of the bullies approached, pushing the boy sitting next to Xi'an and saying, Wow, Xi'an, you really are cool. The boy instinctively complained, Ouch, hey, my seat, but soon lowered his voice and gaze, intimidated. The bully turned with a cold look and asked, What the hell did you say? Do you want to end up like Hyun Ho? He raised his hand, ready to hit the boy, but Xi'an stood up and slapped his hand away holding it. Then he started to laugh and pretending to give a high five said, I tried to hide it, but don't you know him, Sumjin? Let's go outside, I'll tell you what really happened. Other students sought out the boy who was being threatened, comforting him, and watched as Shion left the classroom with judging looks while he walked with the bullies, a sad expression on his face. Oh, by the way, do you guys smoke? I don't smoke, Shion said as he passed through the door. Then why did you ask? The bully Sumjin questioned. The students then commented, I didn't think Park Shion was like this. Another replied, well, they say birds of a feather flock together. Outside, in a more isolated part of the streets, Sean was talking with the group of bullies, sitting on a crate and looking at the cell phone in his hand. So you're saying this photo was sent in the chat group early this morning? He asked, scratching his chin. Yeah, that's right, Sumjin replied while the others smoked. They just shared the photo, said a few words, and left. They commented. The message sent said, is this real? And showed the photo of Xi'an putting a chokehold on Joseph. Then another comment, this is amazing. Xi'an looked up and Sumjin said, but they left after that. Silently observing the chat, Xi'an thought, did those guys from the Mansion of the Dead do this secretly? But for what purpose? Our protagonist then sighed deeply and stood up saying, ah, I've been exposed again. I at least wanted to have a peaceful school life here. If I have to transfer again, I wonder if any other school will accept me. Then with a serious expression, he said, listen carefully, my dear friends. I want to graduate peacefully. I don't want to get involved in games played by kids like this. He took a few steps forward and said, The ones I should deal with aren't kids. I'm already living in an adult world. So let's make sure this matter doesn't spread any further. I'm asking you to handle this situation discreetly, my partners. The bullies blushed. Of course, they had muscles but no brains, and they longed for a leader. So they said, Are we partners with Xi'an? They responded excitedly. Don't worry. Just tell us what to do, Xi'an. However, at that exact moment, Hyun Ho's mother was passing by with some groceries and watched the interaction from a distance, anxious. Xi'an, she murmured with a sad look. Earlier in the principal's office, Hyun Ho's mother reacted angrily when she saw the photo of the boy in the bully's folder. No, no way that Xi'an is... That boy is friends with Hyun Ho. There must have been some misunderstanding, she protested. The principal took the cell phone and replied, But ma'am, please look at this photo as well. This boy is already famous among the kids. There are also testimonies that he was hanging out with a friend named Joseph. The principal turned the cell phone towards her, showing the photo of Joseph and Shion that had spread. I'm hesitant to tell you this, but I think this boy, Shion, is the leader, he said, leaving the woman in denial. It can't be. This isn't true, the principal continued. I've heard that Shion's parents have difficulty being contacted. It seems that this boy doesn't have a good upbringing at home. Based on my experience as a principal, kids like him tend to get into trouble easily. So ma'am, don't trust this boy too much, the principal said, wiping his face again with a handkerchief while sweating profusely. After talking with the bullies, Sean continued on his way with his backpack. I wonder if this will make the rumors die down a bit. They're more naive than I thought. They believed me so easily, our protagonist thought, walking and smiling. Stopping in front of an alley, he said, isn't that right? 
Your name is Mary, right? And turn to a figure hiding behind a wall. Oh my god, I thought I was well hidden, but it seems I wasn't, the blonde girl with pigtails said, smiling as she stepped out from behind the wall. If you wanted to hide, you should have gotten rid of the coffee smell first. It's the same smell you had in front of Huno's house, Sheehan said, looking at her with a serious expression. Wow, you managed to notice someone's smell so quickly? I'm feeling a bit uncomfortable, Mary replied, pretending to shrink back. So, what do you want? Why are you causing trouble and making things difficult for others? Sheehan asked, dropping his backpack and taking a fighting stance. For someone who's in trouble, you seem to be having a lot of fun, the girl replied, pulling a strand of her hair and mimicking him. The ones I should deal with aren't kids. Or something like that? Shion smiled awkwardly, knowing it was indeed embarrassing. So what did you think? I made you the popular bully of that school, Mary asked, crossing her arms. What? I wasn't having any fun, and I was already popular from the start, Shion replied immediately. The girl laughed and, touching her lips with her black-painted nails, responded, No, that's not it. I mean, the cold, hard looks from the kids and the disdainful gazes full of betrayal. Did you enjoy that, Sean? She then smiled broadly, clasping her hands behind her back with a bright aura that contrasted with her intentions. Uh, right, that photo, did you create it? Shion asked, massaging his neck with his shoulders slumped. How is it? Isn't it well done? The girl asked, still smiling. Shion then replied, well done. I was impressed by how bad it was. With something like that, you'd barely fool normal people. Mary raised a finger and retorted, that might be a bit rude of you. Since I didn't have much time and the resources were limited, she gestured somewhat embarrassed. She sighed and said, that's just a lot of dirty excuses, right? And he smiled at her, teasing her. The girl then lowered her hands, quickly stuffing them into her bag and smiling as she pulled out her weapon. She fired several times in Cheyenne's direction from inside the bag. Our protagonist pulled his backpack and used it as a shield, dodging and hiding behind a wall. Are you crazy? Both you and Rachel? Why do you pull out weapons wherever you go? Didn't you say you would bring me back? What if I die? Cheyenne shouted, still hidden. The girl continued shooting and laughing replied, That's quite a joke. If it's the real Sean, he would dodge. I know that. Die. It would be even better if I really killed you here. The girl emptied her gun and for a moment, silence reigned in that alley. Throwing her bag on the ground, she pulled out the weapon again. Shion remained quiet as he heard her approaching. As the girl got close, he reached out and disarmed her, taking the gun from her hand. Mary tried to resist, but Shion threw her against the wall while she attempted a knee strike on him. He noticed and stopped the blow with his hand. Taking advantage of his foot being close, she pulled a small knife from her thigh and tried to stab Shion. The boy raised his elbows, defending himself from the strike, and then hit her with an elbow. Is this all you have? The dead mansion is really dead, huh? Our protagonist said, pushing her. The girl fell to the ground and he held her by the neck. You didn't expect something like this, did you? Cheyenne said with an intimidating look. But Mary's reaction was to laugh, her face flushed, and she replied mockingly, Of course not. It was then that a familiar voice cut through the alley. Cheyenne, what are you doing now? Cheyenne turned immediately and saw Hyono's mother watching him as he subdued the girl with his hand raised, ready to land a punch on her face. What exactly are you doing, Park Xi'an? You shouldn't be doing this. You should be friends with Hyunho. Did you really do this to my Hyunho? The woman asked in shock and somehow still in denial. The girl smiled at Xi'an, who now looked at Hyunho's mother in shock, realizing that everything was part of a plan. No, this isn't what it looks like, Xi'an shouted desperately. Mary took on a different personality and stood up yelling, Aunt, Aunt, as she ran into the arms of Hyunho's mother crying. You're Mary, right? What's going on here? The woman asked, trying to understand the situation. I, I just came here because I had something to ask, but Mary replied between sobs. I'd be Shion got up and in agony shouted, Mom, don't listen. But the woman just looked at him angrily and shouted, Park Shion. Shion immediately froze at the force she had put into his name. Shion, you stay right there and don't move, she ordered. Shion lowered his head, sad, and replied softly, Okay, thinking. Parental command. Mary leaned her head against Hyunho's mother's chest and said, After I took Eugene back with me, I noticed that his body was covered in bruises, and he wasn't speaking. He kept saying that Shion was the one who did it. The woman's eyes widened in terror, and then she remembered waking up and seeing the two playing. She saw Shion denying everything, leaning over the boy and saying, Come on, a fight. This is just a morning exercise? And the boy Eugene twirling the knife saying, Yes, this is just a trick. Then she recalled the principal's words. There was evidence that he was hanging out with Joseph, too. 
You shouldn't trust that boy too much. Mary then continued. That's why I was going to ask him what happened, but he just started hitting me out of nowhere. Hyun Ho's mother pushed Mary aside and walked over to Shion, who rushed to her, desperately pleading, Don't lie! Mom, she's lying! Watching everything from behind the woman, Mary wiped her tears with a wicked smile, thinking, As we promised, we can't do anything to this old woman, Sean. However, there's a way to deal with her without touching her directly. Shion kept pleading, Mom, please listen to me. She made everything up. The truth is, Shion's speech was interrupted by an unexpected act. Hyunho's mother slapped his face, filled with disappointment and heartbreak. He fell silent, looking at the ground with his face still turned away. Mary watched everything, thinking, We just need to make her disown you. Hyunho's mother looked at Shion with tears in her eyes and said, Don't call me mom anymore. Besides, no. Shion looked at her in terror, knowing what was coming, and thought, No, anything but those words. The woman turned her face away bitterly, feeling betrayed, and declared, Never, never come back here. Shion remained silent with his head down. Mary smiled and said softly, Everything is going according to plan. So the next is... Rachel approached, dressed as a middle-aged woman, the same one who had introduced herself to Hyunho's mother as Shion's official mother. Walking in her high heels and luxurious clothes, she said, What's going on, Shion? What trouble have you caused this time? Seriously, you're so problematic. She adjusted her glasses. Shion watched in horror as Rachel pronounced the words. Let's sort this out at home. The director of the dead mansion smiled widely, showing his jewel-filled teeth and exclaimed while banging on the table, You did great, Mary! Looking at the phone on the table, the priest fell to his knees before a painting of Jesus and angels, bowed his head and clasped his hands, saying, Oh my God! Thank you! Finally! Finally! Then he turned back to Mary, who was listening to the director's praises while swinging her feet, sitting near the window of an apartment. Mary, all of this is thanks to you. It was a plan worthy of the strategist of the dead mansion. The girl smiled, her face flushed, and playing with her hair replied, Oh, come on, director, I just did what you told me. The director continued, To think that Sean is finally coming home. The legend of the dead mansion, Sean is... Mary, come back quickly, got it? The girl answered, Of course, understood. Meanwhile, at the kitchen counter of the apartment, Rachel was sitting in front of Shion. Do you like it that much, Sean? She asked the boy in front of her. Are you kidding me? Shion, who would now respond as Sean answered, sweating and with his mouth dirty from sauce. In one hand, he held a slice of pizza, and in the other, a bowl of ramen, with a mint ice cream container in front of him. Rachel had poured a broth with lemon, onion, and mustard over a pile of fries. Sean looked at it, gritting his teeth. We have so much in common. Rachel said mockingly, finishing pouring the broth. You're just forcing me to eat with orders. Besides, your preferences are really strange. Damn, mint and pineapple? He cursed, while in front of him was a mixed mess of food. He's following orders as expected, Rachel thought, smiling wickedly, and then said, Make sure to eat everything. The boy continued eating, mixing pizza, spicy ramen, and ice cream in his mouth, while tears streamed down his face. It seems the property has returned to the dead mansion, Rachel thought. Please, at least give me some milk, I'm begging, the boy pleaded with a disgusted look. A man in a motorized wheelchair approached, saying, You finally caught him. What did you think of the place I got for you? The man had a fixed, wide-open gaze and was bandaged over most of his body. Yeah, it's not bad, Rachel replied. The man moved closer and said, Not bad. This is the most expensive penthouse around here. Sean continued swallowing his food when he murmured to himself, I'm sure I've heard that voice before. The man looked at Sean and said, but it's fine. I don't care how much I spend if it's to catch that damn kid. Sean then stood up, banging on the counter and exclaimed, Ah, you must be a cosplayer? Wait, don't tell me. Let me guess. As Sean spoke, the man began to tremble with rage and bled from his nose. That damn kid, the man cursed. Rachel intervened, declaring, That's enough. Sean calmed down and went back to eating the mixed food, while Rachel pulled out a gun she had kept by her side and pointed it at the man, saying, I'm sure I've told you before, that kid is under our care. In return, we won't do anything to your son. Wasn't that the basis of our cooperation? The man quickly turned his chair and replied, Yes, you don't need to worry. I remember, since it's a deal. And he reached into his jacket to get a handkerchief and wipe his nose. Then he turned back and said, It's not like my target for revenge is just that kid. Rachel stood up, wearing only a loose dress shirt, and walked to the counter, saying, Yes, you can handle other things as you wish, but just remember that it has nothing to do with us, the dead mansion, about you killing that old lady, because the dead mansion promised not to touch that old lady. Right, Sean? The boy turned to her, irritated, and asked, What? 
Did you just say? Are you talking about Hyunho's mother? In her restaurant, Hyunho's mother was preparing more servings of food when a blonde customer approached. Auntie, please give me a serving of taeok boki and also a serving of fried dumplings. She replied with a smile. Yes, I'll prepare that right away. Secretly, the woman suffered as she remembered Xi'an eating her food and saying, Mom, can I really eat all this? The customer pulled her from her memories, pointing to some ready portions and saying, That looks delicious. Give me one of those too. The woman turned, cutting some vegetables with a kitchen knife and replied, Yes, please wait. She continued cutting, tears in her eyes, remembering everything and telling herself, Yes, Xi'an, he's a bad child. He's the one who made my Hyunho like this. Yun Ho's mother kept cutting, even while crying, until the knife hit one of her fingers, slicing her nail. She screamed and bent over, covering her hand. The blonde customer, who was outside, entered the restaurant worried, saying, Auntie, you're bleeding. It looks like you're bleeding a lot. Tears continued to stream down her face as she pressed her hand to try to stop the blood and her own tears, responding, I'm fine. It's okay. It will stop bleeding soon. The man reached into his back pocket and said, Oh, is that so? Then that's good, and pulled out a knife, tightening his grip around the handle. In the apartment, the bandaged man said, Don't worry about the consequences, a business partner of mine will take care of this. The blonde customer approached, raising the knife and ready to stab the woman, who answered her phone saying, Yes, hello, are you serious? She suddenly turned, throwing him back and ran out screaming, Eat as much as you want, don't worry about the money. The murderous customer, confused, asked, Where are you going all of a sudden? She kept running, now crying, and replied, My son! In the hospital, Hyuno opened his eyes as his mother rushed to him, thinking, My son is awake. The doctor leaned over Hyunho's stretcher and asked, Are you conscious? The boy made only a small sound through the oxygen mask, and the doctor continued his barrage of questions. It's going to be hard to talk right away. Don't push yourself. For now, can you tell me where you are? Do you remember what happened before you went into a coma? The boy then began to speak slowly and with difficulty. My memory... I yelled at my mom. Mom said she was sorry. Even though I was the one to blame, I have to apologize. He turned his face, tears in his eyes, after a brief flash of memories passed through his mind and then cried out, Mom, Mom, where are you, Mom? I want to see you. It was then that his mother burst through the door, running to her son, emotional and with watery eyes, saying, Hunho, you really are awake? She reached out to touch him, but the nurse stopped her, holding her bloodied hand from the cut and saying, Miss. The blood! However, Hyunho stretched out his hand and grabbed his mother's wrist. Holding her, he said, Mom, I'm sorry. Mom. They looked at each other with tears in their eyes, crying uncontrollably. I was wrong, said Hyunho. The woman fell to her knees beside the stretcher and began to sob, holding her son's hand. Outside, peeking through the door of the room, the blonde assassin watched. They're together now. Should I look for an opportunity to take care of both at once? He spoke on the phone, receiving the reply. No, just stay on standby. We're going to abort the mission. The bandaged man then declared, The plan has changed. In another place, Rachel threw a chair, freeing herself from her restraints and shouting, You dare, you dare. How can someone like him kidnap my Sean? She spoke with blood trickling from the corner of her mouth. Sean was immobilized by two guards and gagged in front of the bandaged man, who leaned over him, smiling and saying on the phone, I'll take care of them myself in front of that bastard in a building whose facade boasted the inscription, White Tiger Employment Center, Workers for Hire. Rachel waited inside with a bored expression, sitting on a sofa, leaning forward with visible bags under her eyes. Next to her, Eugene waited tensely, sitting upright and squeezing his knees. Were you waiting? Would you like a coffee? A woman approached, holding a tray with a mug and a paper cup. Rachel leaned back on the sofa and crossed her arms, saying, Yes, you're really slow. Is it worth making me wait this long? The woman placed the paper cup on the table in front of Rachel and laughed, saying, Sorry about that. Picking up a clipboard, she declared, The market and the headquarters of Byung-woo Construction. There were a lot of things to account for since you made such a mess. She placed the clipboard in front of Rachel and then walked over to Eugene, placing the mug in front of him and smiling. This hot chocolate is for the little friend here. Drink slowly. Eugene looked at her and replied, Yes, thank you. The boy carefully took the mug while glancing at Rachel, shrinking back. That's why we're paying you so much money, right? Let's act more professionally, Rachel said, holding the cup in her hand. The woman sat on the sofa in front of them, crossed her legs and replied while holding a cup. Professional, you're right. But don't you think it's a bit unprofessional to make such a mess without considering the consequences? That's what I think. Rachel glared at her and asked, what? 
The woman chuckled and covered her mouth with her hand, saying, Oh my, what am I saying? Eugene watched everything anxiously and hunched over, seeing the tension in the room and holding the chocolate with both hands, thinking, I should have stayed home. Rachel picked up the clipboard in front of her and said, Anyway, I took care of this according to the reports, so take a look. But why am I being served in a paper cup? The woman took a sip from her cup and said, Oh, I just remembered. Byungwoo Construction said they didn't need any compensation. How did you manage that? Rachel took a sip of the coffee and shook the folder, saying, We just had something that both of us needed. That's how a professional does things, the woman continued. So, any mess made by Byungwoo Construction has nothing to do with us. Rachel looked at the coffee, startled and blushed, replying, Yes, that's how it is. The woman then said, Still, it would be better if you were a little more careful. Eugene took a sip of his chocolate, looking at her, and Rachel asked, What does that mean? The woman placed the cup on the saucer and replied, As a professional, you should deal with other professionals, not with some delinquents, right? Can Byungwoo Construction really be trusted? I wonder if they are worthy of being business partners, the woman said condescendingly. Rachel looked shocked. Sometime later, Rachel found herself in the same room throwing a chair and screaming, Damn, those fucking bastards! She cursed, grabbing her gun, while blood dripped from her mouth. Blood dripped. A truck sped down the road through the city, accompanied by a luxury car. Inside, the bandaged man spoke to Sean. I really can't believe it. To think you're so useless without orders. He leaned in and tugged at a strand of Sean's hair, saying, So you're under the dead mansion and can't do anything without them telling you to, right? That's really surprising. Is this some kind of brainwashing? Sean looked at him, biting the gag, while the man laughed. The man turned the chair around and said, Suddenly I thought of something interesting. I just imagined it. I would buy you and order you. Kill the old lady at the snack stand. Sean heard that with tears in his eyes, overwhelmed by a sudden despair. The man burst into laughter and said, That would have been really interesting to see. Then he turned back and said, Come on, you can't make those expressions yet. I haven't even started. He leaned in, getting very close to Sean's face, and said, Soon I'll tear apart the old lady and her son right in front of your eyes, and you won't be able to do anything but watch as it happens. Because you can't do anything without orders. So you should just sit back and enjoy the show. You'll be next. The man turned and wiped the blood from his nose again, tilting his head. Didn't I tell you that I'm going to kill all of you? Meanwhile, in the hospital, Hyunho's mother was cutting an apple for her son. Watching his mother's hands, he asked, Did you cut yourself? Now without the oxygen mask. Hmm? Oh, this? I just cut myself a little. It's nothing serious, she replied, waving her hands and smiling. You always say that. I'm going to ask for some band-aids, Hyunho said, sitting on the bed, now without the IV connected to him, but with one foot in an orthopedic boot. Oh, don't worry. Just stay still, his mother said, trying to get him to rest. It's okay. The doctor said I should try to move around a bit, Hyunho replied, still sitting. His mother smiled and said, All right. I'll ask for a band-aid, so stay here. As she walked out the door, she thought to herself, You're so stubborn, just like your father. But why is it so dark in here? The hospital corridors were dim, the place completely immersed in darkness. Excuse me, is anyone here? The woman asked, approaching the reception desk. Where did everyone go? She asked herself again, not noticing a man approaching behind her. The man struck her neck, causing her to faint. She collapsed unconscious on the floor, and the man said, One down. He then walked to where Sean was held by the thugs and said, Go put her in the car first, this is really interesting. You really can't do anything, can you? Sean looked at him, filled with hatred, but unable to react. The door to Huno's room opened and he said, smiling, What took so long? However, instead of his mother, he saw the bandaged man. Yes, sorry for the delay. I finally got to see what you look like. You're Hyunho, right? He entered the room, wiping his nose again, and Hyunho shrank back in bed. Who are you? The boy asked, apprehensive. The man then approached the bed, accompanied by a group of security guards. Me? Well, I'm... Right, I'm Joseph's father. It seems Joseph did some bad things to you. That's really unfortunate. It must have hurt a lot. That's why I told him that efficiency is key. The man flicked Yunho's boot and said, By leaving you half alive, we have to do the job again. Yunho looked at him in desperation, realizing his future. All right, I admit it. The words of that girl from the White Tiger Employment Center were right. I shouldn't have worked with those bastards. Rachel said, stepping with her heel on the edge of the building and raising a gun. Then she fired a grappling hook above Hyunho's room. The guard noticed the movement, but before he could do anything, Rachel appeared sliding down the cable, breaking the window and invading the room. She spun around, knocking them down and shouting, You third-class delinquents! My Sean! How dare you betray the dead mansion! Byung-woo smiled and said, She really came. 
Rachel took down all the agents, aiming to cut their tendons. She got up, slashing them in the chest, until one of the guards hugged her from behind, tightly restraining her arms. I got her! I got her! He said frantically, lifting her off the ground. Rachel smiled and said, Do you like hugging me that much? Then she threw her head back, headbutting the man and breaking his nose. He released her, instinctively covering his nose, took a few steps back, and staggered, falling onto another. Rachel kicked him, sending both of them out of the room and breaking the window. What are you doing? Hyuno shouted as one of the men grabbed him by the shoulders, and Byung Woo turned his chair with his characteristic glazed look. Get the kid first. Let's stick to the plan, the security guard said, running down the corridor, while Byung Woo sped off in his motorized chair. Rachel charged forward, taking down another guard and slicing his abdomen with a knife. Where do you think you're going? I'll ask you again. You filthy bastards, where is Sean? The assassin declared, now walking toward the men. You came? The lead guard replied, snapping his fingers. Then from the adjacent rooms, more and more thugs emerged. Rachel turned, realizing the company. Armed men with hammers, knives, all surrounding her. Why are there so many of you? Are you cockroaches or something? She said, smiling. One of them approached and started a chainsaw. You even brought some interesting tools, Rachel declared, dropping her small knife and taking off her robe. Underneath, she revealed a tight black jumpsuit with weapons hanging and more knives attached. Come at me, you filthy cockroaches, she shouted, starting to fire her weapons at the men around her. Some of them fell, hit, while others retreated. The one holding the chainsaw remained standing, along with others who were sweating profusely. Rachel aimed her weapons to both sides, alert and smiling. The lead guard laughed and said, So you want to play with guns, huh? He pulled out a hidden weapon from under one of his arms. Sean noticed, his eyes widening, but he was still immobilized. The shot hit Rachel's thigh and she looked on with hatred but did not react. I'll aim for your head now, said the guard, removing the cast from his arm and revealing the gun. Sean pulled the gag from his mouth and asked, So does that mean you're going to kill her? The two men holding him were quickly subdued and Sean advanced, burying a punch in the security guard's face. How? There were orders, the man asked, confused. Sean then lifted his gaze and replied, Did you forget? I'm currently under the dead mansion, and you just threatened to kill an instructor from the dead mansion. According to the third principle, I classify all of you as a threat to the dead mansion. Rachel looked at him in disbelief and repeated, Sean? Then she saw her pupil walking toward her with hatred in his eyes, saying, I will overcome the current situation. This was the special multifunctional training weapon project of the dead mansion. Good boy. Codename, Sean. Park Cheyenne. Current affiliation, Dead Mansion.